Good afternoon. Thank you for joining the webinar. My name is Sean Rogers, and I'm with the Council of State Governments Justice Center. Before turning the webinar over to the featured speakers to talk about the Federal Interagency Reentry Council and their Mythbuster series, I'd like to briefly talk through a couple of house cleaning items about how the webinar is going to work, and then take a brief moment to tell you a little bit about the National Reentry Resource Center. Anytime during this webinar, you can ask a question simply by typing it into the Q&A panel on the bottom right-hand portion of your screen. We will keep a running list of the content-related questions that we receive, and then ask the panelists to respond to the questions during the last segment of, of the webinar. We will do our best to get through as many questions as possible. If you encounter technical or audio problems during this webinar, please call WebEx Technical Support at 1-866-229-3239. I'll post this webinar um, in the chat uh, panel in, in just a moment. Please understand that there are some technical issues that you may not be able to resolve. For this reason, we are recording this event and will post it on our website at www.nationalreentryresourcecenter.org. We should have the webinar posted online late this week, and once it has been posted, we will email you a link to the recording. The National Reentry Resource Center is now in its third year, and it was established by the Second Chance Act to provide education, training, and technical assistance to states, tribes, territories, local governments, service providers, nonprofit organizations, and corrections institutions working on prisoner reentry. The Resource Center is administered by the Council of State Governments in partnership with the Bureau of Justice Assistance, U.S. Department of Justice. On this slide, I've listed the key objectives that have been outlined for the National Reentry Resource Center. These are provide a one-stop, interactive source of current, user-friendly reentry information, identify, document, and promote evidence-based practices, advance the reentry field through training, distance learning, and the knowledge development, and deliver individual targeted technical assistance to the Second Chance Act grantees. This is a snapshot of the Resource Center's home page. We are constantly adding new content and resources to our website, and we send out a monthly newsletter that provides information about the latest research, funding opportunities, distance learning events, and other news about reentry. To sign up for the newsletter, please visit www.nationalreentryresourcecenter.org after today's webinar. And I've circled in red on this slide um, the, the, the place where you can sign up and register to actually receive the newsletter. All right. Um, with that, I'd like to turn the webinar now. I'd like to turn it over to Amy Solomon, who is a senior advisor to the Assistant Attorney General. Amy? Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. And thanks for joining this webinar on the Reentry Council's Reentry Mythbusters. Um, again, my name is Amy Solomon. I'm with the Department of Justice, and I'm joined here by a wonderful team from Justice and eight other federal uh, departments. So here in the room with me, I've got Marlene Beckman and Tom Murphy from the Department of Justice, Ron Ashford from HUD, Sean Clark from Veterans Affairs, Todd Cox from the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, Linda Melgren from Health and Human Services, and Richard Morris from the Department of Labor. We've got other federal partners with us joining us by phone. Uh, John Linton from the Department of Education. I believe that Angela Klein and Stephanie Davis from Agriculture are with us. Al Satur from Social Security. And I believe that Greg Welts and Carmen Ortiz from Department of Labor are joining us by phone as well. So let me walk through our presentation plan. I'm going to give you a brief overview of the Reentry Council, and then we'll introduce the Mythbusters. Uh, after a, a general overview, Ron Ashford is going to talk about the public housing Mythbuster. Todd Cox will summarize all of the employment-related Mythbusters. Linda Melgren is going to cover federal benefits. Sean Clark is going to go through the veterans-related benefits. And then Tom Murphy will discuss the juvenile Mythbusters. We're not going to detail each and every Mythbuster, 
but we do want to walk you through some highlights. So our plan is to leave about 30 minutes at the end to answer your questions. Let's get started. As many of you know, Attorney General Holder convened the first meeting of the Reentry Council in January of this year. So you're looking now at a photo of the first meeting, and it was just a remarkable meeting. We had seven cabinet officials at the table, as well as key administration leaders. Um, everyone at the table was, was productive and engaged in thinking about concrete, uh, creative solutions to this issue. So at that first meeting, uh, the council adopted a mission statement to make communities safer by reducing recidivism and victimization to assist those returning from prison and jail in becoming uh, productive citizens, and to save taxpayer dollars by lowering the direct and collateral costs of incarceration. The council also empowered staff, which now represent 19 federal departments and agencies, to work towards these goals. The council agreed to meet twice a year, and the second meeting was held just this September. And that meeting was equally remarkable. The agency leaders came to the table with actions that their agencies had already taken uh, to address their piece of the puzzle. So I'm going to skip through a couple of these slides. I do want to pause here and uh, show you these are the 19 agencies that are participating in the Reentry Council. I know it's a lot of acronyms here, but we're going to talk through a number of them, and we have them all listed on our website. We've also got here the uh, full mission statement and the goals, uh, just so you have them. And I want to pause here to talk about how we're organizing our work. Uh, the council is focused on the unique ways that we can make a difference. So the first thing we're focused on is coordinating and leveraging the federal resources that are already committed to reentry in jurisdictions around the country. Second, we're focused on removing or helping navigate federal barriers to reentry. And third, we're using the bully pulpit to advance the reentry agenda and provide visibility to programs and policies that work. So I'm going to walk through each of these very quickly. In terms of coordinating resources, we're doing this in many ways, a few of which are listed here on the slide, and I'm going to illustrate just one. You may have seen this on the National Reentry Resource Center website, um, and we think it's an important tool for all of you. The federal agencies have inventoried our federal uh, resource streams and our colleagues at the Resource Center have mapped them. So you can now go to this interactive map, click on your state, and see what reentry grants are already in play locally. And particularly in this economy, we want to look at where our collective resources are going and see where we can leverage them, both nationally and locally. The second way that the Reentry Council is focusing its attention is on removing and navigating federal barriers to reentry employment barriers, housing barriers, and access to federal benefits like TANF, SNAP, Medicaid, and veterans benefits. We're honing in on how to connect people to key benefits before the release. The goal here is to stabilize the reentry population immediately after release when they're most at risk of relapse and reoffending. And third, we're working to use the bully pulpit, the voice of our leaders and the power of persuasion to bring these issues and potential solutions to light. The Attorney General and Department Secretaries are talking about reentry in speeches and meetings. They're holding events, they're writing to their colleagues in the field, and they're reaching out to stakeholders in all of our respective disciplines. We've also developed a website on the National Reentry Resource Center, a website with access to all of our materials, and you can see this link at the bottom of your screen. So that is a very, very brief overview of the council. And now we're going to turn to the Reentry Mythbusters, which are one of the first products of the Reentry Council. The Mythbusters are essentially one-pagers that are designed to clarify existing policies and point people to resources that can be helpful. To date, we've released 22 uh, Reentry Mythbusters. Here's what the Mythbusters look like. If you look at the right hand of the slide, each Mythbuster Mythbuster lists the myth and the fact, followed by some key details, and then links to useful resources on the topic at hand. So we're not going to go through the full uh, Mythbusters today for each one, but hopefully you've read through some of them, and you can see that if you go to them directly, they'll be able to link you to a larger pool of information on each given topic. So as you'll hear, some federal laws and policies are actually more narrow than is commonly perceived. 
as is the case of public housing and food assistance benefits. In several policy areas, states and localities have broad discretion in determining how policies are applied or have various opt-out provisions for states, like TANF and child support do. In some cases, statutory barriers do not exist at all or are very limited. And in fact, some federal policies contain incentives for assisting the formerly convicted population. Uh, so examples here are the federal bonding and tax incentives for employers who hire people with a criminal record. In terms of who can use the Mythbusters, uh, they're designed for a broad range of stakeholders. So corrections officials, service providers, probation and parole officers, officers caseworkers, employers, workforce development specialists, and state and local agencies. You can see we've covered a lot of topics. We've got five on employment issues, 10 covering federal benefits, and our most recent three uh, focus on juvenile reentry issues. These Mythbusters don't solve all of our problems, and they don't change federal policy, but they often provide a helpful first step in many areas. And so without further ado, let me turn to Ron Ashford from HUD, who's going to talk through the public housing Mythbusters. Okay, thank you very much, Amy. Um, we, we know that housing is one of the greatest needs for ex-offenders coming out of, of prison. And um, so we, we look at housing, we're a member of the Reentry Council, and early on in the Reentry Council, probably about a year ago, I think it was somebody from Department of Labor who said, you know, there's this urgent urban legend out there, which is that ex-offenders cannot access public housing. What's the real deal? And so we, we know that that thought is out there. We know that even some of our public housing authorities believe that you're an ex-offender, you cannot access public housing. But in fact, that's wrong. And um, there are two categories of people who are, in fact, barred from public housing. One are the makers of methamphetamine. They're forever barred. And two, if you're on the lifetime sex, sex offender ban, you're also barred from public housing. Everything else, Everyone else is up to the local public housing authority. They have the discretion to change their occupancy procedures to allow ex-offenders or, in fact, anyone besides those two categories back into public housing. And so what have we done about this? The first thing we did was we put out a myth buster so that not only public housing authorities are clear on what the correct HUD stance is, but also so that you from different walks of life know what the public housing rules are with regard to who can come back into public housing. The other thing that we've done, and if we, the other thing we've done is that our secretary and our assistant secretary for public housing sent a letter out to all 3,200 housing authorities and crystallized the policy and said, okay, here it is. Two, two categories of people may not come back, and we encourage housing authorities, where appropriate, to loosen up their registration or occupancy procedures. So that's one of the things we've done. We know that housing authorities can be very reluctant to have ex-offenders come in, and thinking through this and talking to public housing authorities, there's two big reasons. One is that other public housing residents are very gun-shy about having ex-offenders come in. They're, they're saying, no, you know, that guy used to be a crack dealer. We don't want him in. The other one is that executive directors and uh, folks on the board are reluctant to go in that direction because if they did and something were to happen, their name would be in the newspaper. The third thing is that there isn't, in a lot of instances, a safety net so that an ex-offender coming in is being case managed, is being worked with, is being supported, and a lot of housing authorities may look out and say, well, if that's not there, then why am I going to be the one to step out there, right? So those are three big factors. So one of the things that we're doing is uh, we're doing two things. One is we're trying to link up our housing authorities with the grantees from Department of Labor, from Department of Justice, from HHS. And HHS, in fact, has had a marriage and fatherhood conference. I spoke at that marriage and fatherhood conference and really urged them to talk with our public housing authorities. 
because if you have a program, if you have a Department of Labor RETSO grant, and you are establishing a safety net, you might want to talk to the housing authority and broker that relationship. So that's one of the things we're doing. The other is we're trying to create a pilot program so that we can prove to housing authorities that if you walk in this direction, you'll be safe. So the pilot program, as we envision it, has, a, again, a support system. It has case management. It has counseling. Um, the leaseholder would raise their hand and say, yes, I'm willing to have the sex offender come in. That leaseholder would not be held liable if, for some reason, the sex offender did something wrong. They would still keep their apartment, and we would hold the rent constant. So we're looking to develop this pilot uh, in in line with developing the pilot, we've surveyed a lot of our housing authorities, and what we found is that housing authorities will use Section 8 vouchers. Some will use Section 8 vouchers for ex-offenders, which is a great step, but there's only one that we know of across the country that are using conventional public housing units to house ex-offenders. So that's what we want to crack. That's what we want to break open. And we think that the myth buster and the letter from Secretary Donovan is going to help us do that. So I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Great. Amy. Thank you. Uh, we're now going to hear from Todd Cox, who's going to talk through some of the employment myth busters. Thank you, Amy, and good afternoon. We know how important employment opportunities are to those reentering society from some period of incarceration. In fact, it's key to successful reentry. So the Reentry Council has developed five employment-related mythbusters to clarify a federal policy in this area. Today we're going to focus on four. The first two lay out some incentives for employers in this area. The next two, or the last two we're going to discuss, explain the rights and responsibilities of applicants, job applicants, workers, and employers during the employment process. The first myth buster we're going to discuss addresses the myth that, as you can see, employers have no federal income tax advantage by hiring a former offender. Well, the fact is, actually, employers can realize a tax advantage here through the Work Opportunity Tax Credit Program. The main objective of the program is to enable certified employees to move from economic dependency to self-sufficiency as they earn steady incomes and become taxpayers. Participating employers are compensated by being able to reduce their federal income tax liability. This program joins other workforce programs to help incentivize workplace diversity and facilitate access to good jobs. The WOTC um, provides the following credit. 25% of qualified first-year wages for those employed at least 120 hours or $1,500. 40% for those employed 400 hours or more or $2,400. The target groups for the program are private, for-profit employers who can hire individuals from nine target groups. We've already discussed uh, one group being the qualified and former, formerly incarcerated individual. Included also are qualified TANF recipients, qualified veterans, qualified designated community residents, qualified vocational uh, individual, uh, vocational um, uh, individuals, rehabilitation uh, referral, qualified summer youth, qualified food stamp recipients qualified supplemental security income recipients, and qualified long-term family assistance recipients. The second myth buster in the incentive uh, set here is uh, designed to respond to the myth that businesses and employers have no way to protect themselves from potential losses uh, if they should hire someone uh, who is proven to be dishonest. Well, the fact is, through the federal bonding program, um, uh, the bonds are available to protect employers from potential losses in this area. And why is this so important? Well, job seekers who have committed a fraudulent or dishonest act, uh, or been convicted of that, or whose credibility or honesty is in doubt, are very often rejected from employment. This program, the SBP, is an employer hiring incentive program guaranteeing the job honesty of at-risk job seekers, including the former offenders. The Department of Labor provides state workforce agencies with a package of promotional bonds to provide a base and incentive to employers and others to participate. Additional bonds may be purchased from bonding agents by states, localities, and other organizations. Employers receive bonded employees free of charge, which serves as an incentive to hire hard-to-place applicants. The bond uh, insurance uh, reimburses an employer for any loss due to employee theft with no employer deductible. The program has proven to be very successful. 
Only 1% of the bonds ever issued resulted in a claim. And as Amy alluded to, we have our GOL colleagues here who are also, um, also on the line as well as in the room who will be happy to comment further about uh, these incentives and will be available to ask, uh, answer questions also. The second set of mythbusters we will be discussing today concern the rights and responsibilities of workers, job applicants, and employers. And the first mythbuster in this set of uh, mythbusters we're going to talk about responds to the uh, myth that people with criminal records are automatically barred from employment. Well, an, an arrest or a commission record does not automatically bar you from employment. Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, in fact, makes it unlawful to discriminate in employment based on race, color, national origin, religion, or sex. While Title VII does not prohibit an employer from requiring applicants to provide information about arrests and convictions or incarceration, employers may not treat people with the same criminal records differently because of their race or national origin. In addition, in the vast majority of cases, uh, employers may not automatically bar everyone with an arrest or conviction record from employment, as such an automatic bar might uh, limit the employment opportunities for applicants because of their race or ethnicity. If an employer is aware of a condition or incarceration, that should only bar someone from, from conviction if it's closely related to the job, and the employer should consider, number one, the nature of the job, the nature and seriousness of the offense, and the length of time since the offense occurred. In the context of an arrest, since an arrest does not automatically or necessarily mean that someone has committed a crime, an employer should not assume that someone who has been arrested but not convicted committed the offense. Instead, the employer should allow the person to explain the circumstances of the arrest, and if it appears that he or she is engaged in the unlawful conduct, still go through this individual assessment and allow and, and, and consider uh, whether or not the job is related uh, to the uh, arrest record or the arrested uh, offense. These rules apply to all employers that have 15 or more employees, and they include uh, employers in the private sector, the federal government, and federal contractors. The last mythbuster we, we will be discussing on, on the responsibility side of things concerns the use of criminal history and the employment background checks. Um, specifically, the myth is an employer can get a copy, as we see here, of a criminal history from a company that do background checks without uh, an, an applicant's permission. Well, the fact is that the Fair Credit Reporting Act, FICRA, requires employers to get an applicant's permission before seeking a criminal history report. An employer that might use an individual's criminal, criminal history report to take an adverse action, denying employment, for example, must provide a copy of the report in a document called a Summary of Your Rights Under the Fair Credit Reporting Act before taking the adverse action and tell the individual, number one, the name, address, and telephone number of the company that supplied the criminal history report. You must also tell the individual that the company that provided the report did not make the decision to take the adverse action and cannot give specific reasons for it. And finally, must inform the individual of his or her rights to dispute the accuracy or completeness of the report and their right to another free report if requested within 60 days. If an employer violates FICRA or is suspected of violating FICRA, it should be reported to the FTC. The law allows the FTC, other federal agencies, and states to take legal action against employers who fail to comply with the law's provisions. FICRA also allows individuals to take legal action against employers in state or federal courts for certain violations. Amy? Great. Thank you, Todd. We're now going to hear from Linda Melvin from HHS on some of the federal benefits, Ms. Buster. Thank you, Amy. In addition to housing and employment, many of the reentry Ms. Busters are focused on making sure the rules regarding services and benefits are clear for individuals leaving jails or prisons. In fact, there's a special working group um, of the reentry council that is working specifically on issues related to access, of, access to benefits, and that involves many of the departments um, throughout the federal government. The purpose of this group is to clarify the rules to make sure that a broad audience knows what the rules are. The next slides uh, we're going to be discussing, the next seven slides, presents information on um, a series of benefit and services programs, and those include child support, child welfare, student aid, Medicaid, CANIS, the Supplemental Food and Nutrition Program, SNAP, formerly known as food stamps, and Social Security benefits. This is a whirlwind tour, so please feel free to ask questions 
um, because we'll just be touching the, the very surface of this. Um, the first um, services is child support. Now, child support is normally not considered a, is considered a service for the family receiving support, not the individual paying support, which is um, the situation for most of the, the folks that we're going to be talking about. But it is a service to have an order reduced while incarcerated so that the amount of child support owed when leaving prison is not an overwhelmingly large amount. The federal government has no rules prohibiting reduction of orders while incarcerated and for some time have been encouraging states to review their policies to ensure that they are fair to both parents. Half of all states have identified processes to reduce orders while they're in, in prison. That is, they actually have developed a process whereby um, individuals in prison can go through um, to request that their order be reduced. And an additional quarter of all states have law that permit such reduction. Uh, two things are important to note. One is, is that this is not done automatically that the individuals in prison have to request that these changes be made through their local child support enforcement program. And secondly, these modifications need to be made prospectively, not retrospectively. That is, you have to ask in advance that your orders be reduced um, because there are rules that prohibit um, what is considered a retroactive modification of orders. That is, after the amount of child support has accrued, it is much more difficult to get that amount reduced. The second program we're going to talk about um, is child welfare. Um, the myth is that child welfare agencies are required to terminate parental rights if a parent is incarcerated. And it is true that the federal law in this area is quite strict. Um, the federal law does require states to have processes in place to terminate parental rights if family reunification is not possible within a specific length of time. But the law also allows states to have exceptions. And those two exceptions are based on two factors. One, if the child is in the care of a relative, or secondly, if the termination would not be in the best interest of the child. Usually these decisions are made on a case-by-case -case basis. Every state's processes work differently, so it is important to get to know the judges, managers, and caseworkers in the child welfare system to identify solutions that would give children stability and parents hope for reunification if reunification is feasible. Another myth is that a person with a criminal record is not eligible to receive federal student financial aid. And it is true that while someone is incarcerated, it is, there is very, very limited eligibility for any kind of student age. But in general, when someone leaves prison, those restrictions are lifted and financial aid is available except under two um, conditions. One is that the individual was convicted of a drug offense while receiving student age or was convicted of a sexual offense. What is important to note here is that for formerly incarcerated individuals, this means that people who are under parole, probation, or residing in halfway houses, in fact, are eligible to apply for student financial aid. The next myth has to do with whether or not whether or not Medicaid agencies are required to terminate benefits if an otherwise eligible individual is incarcerated. There is no federal requirement that says that states need to terminate eligibility for individuals who are incarcerated solely based on their inmate state status. What the law does require is that 
when someone is incarcerated, even if they are eligible for Medicaid, the Medicaid agency cannot be billed for services. That means the Department of Corrections, you know, whether they're jails or prisons, cannot say, this person is an eligible Medicaid recipient. I can charge off the cost of his care to Medicaid. That is specifically prohibited by law. But what states can do is that they can suspend people's eligibility for Medicaid. That is, they can assign them as eligible for Medicaid but not eligible to receive benefits. And there are two really good reasons for suspending rather than terminating benefits. Um, and that benefits corrections as well as individuals. One is that Medicaid can pay for hospital care provided outside of the penal institution. That is, if somebody is so sick that they have to go to a specialized hospital or a hospital that has a different level of care, um, their care, if they're eligible for Medicaid, can be provided by Medicaid uh, because they are no longer in the correctional institution during that period of care. The second and more important, um, I think, reason from a reentry perspective is that eligibility can be reactivated quickly upon release if it is suspended rather than terminated. Citizens returning to the community can get needed medications and care more quickly. And it is important to note here that some states, either in conjunction with an SSI application or because the state Medicaid plan covers childless adults, are beginning the application process for Medicaid benefits prior to release. Because there are so many differences across states, and even across counties within a state, it is very important to find out what your state policies are as it relates to Medicaid suspension and termination. And these policies are the same for adults and for juveniles. So um, it doesn't, there, there is no difference uh, based on the age of the individual who would be Medicaid eligible. The next set of misbusters, and we're going to talk about two of them together, relate to TANF and, and SNAP, or food stamp benefits. Um, a federal ban on receipt of TANF and, and SNAP um, for persons with a felony drug conviction was enacted as part of the 1996 welfare reform provision. But the law provided states with the flexibility to opt out of the ban. Despite the fact that states had to pass legislation to do so, most states have opted out either fully or modified the ban so that receipt of TANF and SNAP is possible for persons returning to the community from prison. The rules for receipt of TANF and SNAP are not always the same, so make sure you check how your state's rules apply to both of those programs. I think there are 11 states that have kept the ban in place for TANF and 13 that have kept the ban in place for food stamps. And lastly, we're going to talk about eligibility for Social Security benefits. Um, one of the myths is that Social Security benefits cannot be reinstated when an individual is released from incarceration. And that is not correct. Social Security benefits are suspended if an individual is incarcerated for more than 30 days. However, they can be reinstated upon release by contacting Social Security and providing proof of release. It is important to note that Social Security matches against prison and jail records so that individuals should notify Social Security to stop payment. If an individual is paid while in prison, that can result in an overpayment on an account, and benefits can be withheld to recover the overpayment if they are reinstated upon release. Back to you, Amy. Great. Thank you so much, Linda. We're going to turn now to Sean Clark with Veterans Affairs, who's going to walk through two veterans-related misbusters. Sean. Thank you, Amy, and good afternoon, everybody. As you're very likely aware, um, Individuals who serve in the military become eligible as a result of that service for benefits above and beyond what the general population is eligible for. 
Those benefits fall into three main categories, and, and the VA's organization mirrors those categories of benefits. The first is to be repetitive benefits, um, which, we ref which is a term we use to refer to mostly monetary supports. The main categories of these are uh, compensation for service-connected disabilities, uh, pension benefits for non-service-connected conditions, um, as well as ed educational benefits. Many of you will be familiar with the GI Bill, uh, as well as vocational rehabilitation and education and a variety of other services as well. There are about a dozen other types uh, of monetary benefits available to veterans through the Veterans Benefits Administration, uh, one of those three main categories. And I'd encourage you to, to become familiar with those uh, using the web resources that are on the, on the VBA Mythbuster. The myth that we have here um, on, for VBA purposes, um, and I'll be moving on to healthcare right after this, um, the third, uh, just to complete uh, the three categories, is uh, the cemeteries, the national cemetery system um, that VA administers uh, for our purposes, less relevant um, than the economic and healthcare benefits that are available to veterans coming out uh, of the correctional system. Uh, so to back up, uh, the Veterans Benefits Myth Buster, as you see, the myth here is that veterans can't request to have their VA benefits resumed until they're officially released from incarceration. To, to take a step back um, for just a moment, what this presumes is that those benefits have been reduced or discontinued as a result of that veteran's being incarcerated. What happens when an individual is convicted and incarcerated for more than 60 days, whether that conviction is for a misdemeanor or for a felony matters, depending on what type of benefit uh, the veteran was receiving, but that's, that's a level of detail beyond which we're going to be able to go into right now. Um, after that 61st day, the veteran's benefits will be either reduced or they'll be discontinued entirely. It has always been true that once the veteran is released, that he or she has been able to apply to have those benefits restored to their full level, so I, where they were before the reduction, uh, or reactivated if they were discontinued entirely. What this MythBuster addresses is the policy that's now in place, and as you see on the fact side of the ledger here, Veterans can apply to VA uh, to have the benefits, uh, again, either restored to their full level or restarted uh, when they are still incarcerated but within 30 days of the anticipated date of release, provided they submit evidence from the parole board or another official correctional source showing the date of the veteran's scheduled release. The intent behind this process is to help the veteran get basically a, a jump start on the reentry process. That initial month, two month period, uh, it can be a very critical time and it can have a, a, a serious negative impact um, when that veteran is again facing so many barriers, searching for employment, uh, barriers faced by the, the reentry population as a whole. Uh, but again, an, an effort to get them reconnected with the benefits that they have earned, but they were, but that were suspended during their incarceration, uh, as a support uh, to encourage successful reentry for these veterans. Um, so the action step for a veteran in this position uh, is again submitting this evidence to the regional office. VBA has 57 regional offices uh, on the website. You can find a map uh, showing the location of all of those. Each one of these offices has a homeless and incarcerated veteran outreach coordinator. Uh, and so that's, that's the individual, the point person, uh, if you like, uh, for veterans who are in this posture. Um, if we move on to the next benefit, which has to do with veterans' health care. Uh, I mentioned the Veterans Benefits Administration. Uh, veterans' health care is administered by the Veterans Health Administration, the second uh, of three VA's three main components. The myth here is that a veteran with criminal convictions or a history of incarceration is not eligible for VA health care. So essentially, having a criminal past is going to make you ineligible for health care um, services provided by the VA. Uh, this is not accurate. Um, and as we see on the fact side of the slide here, an eligible veteran, and I'll come back to the word eligible in a moment, who is not currently incarcerated can access VA care regardless of any criminal history, uh, including incarceration. So only when an otherwise eligible veteran is currently incarcerated or in a fugitive felon status is VA health care not available. So a word about eligibility that is determined by a number of factors. Um, the prime factor in an eligibility determination is the status, is an individual's discharge status. So a dishonorable discharge, a bad conduct discharge, what's known colloquially as bad paper uh, in the veterans community, um, has a negative impact on someone's eligibility for VA health care. Honorable discharges, 
uh, excuse me, um, general discharges under honorable conditions, uh, and there are a variety of other categories uh, in between. Um, those are determined on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, so eligibility, um, again, the, the takeaway version of this, uh, determined primarily with uh, reference to an individual's discharge status. VA cannot provide treatment while a veteran is incarcerated in jail or prison. Um, the incarcerating authority during that period of time is constitutionally obligated to provide the care that that individual needs, so VA does not provide it. Um, but current incarceration and, again, fugitive felon status, so having an open warrant um, where the underlying offense was a felony, those are the only instances in which someone's involvement with the criminal justice system can prevent an eligible veteran from receiving health care from VA. One prominent exception to this, and this is, this is fairly new, this has only been in place since April of this year. As you, as you may know, when individuals go into a halfway house um, situation, um, many other terms for this, a work release program, um, a correctional uh, re uh, community reentry center, excuse me, um, oftentimes they'll have to waive their eligibility for health care, whether that's provided by Bureau of Prisons on the federal side or by the state as a condition of getting into that program. Um, because these veterans are they're still under correctional control, they're still inmates, they have tended to fall between the cracks. They've signed away their eligibility um, from the federal government to BOP or the state, and VA still considers them incarcerated and has not been able to treat them. So they've been between a rock and a hard place. As of April 1st of 2011, veterans who are in these halfway house or work release centers are eligible for VA health care. Uh, we changed the regulation uh, and, and expanded eligibility to include those veterans in recognition of the fact that they're in the reentry process as well uh, and, and, and need that uh, access to that critical health care benefit. Um, I think with that, I will um, thank you for, uh, for having me this afternoon and turn it back over to Amy. Great. Thank you, Sean. We're now going to hear from Tom Mercy from uh, the Office of Juvenile Justice, Delinquency and Prevention here at Justice, who's going to talk about the juvenile reentry mythbusters. Thank you, Amy. Um, before I talk about the last two remaining uh, mythbusters pertaining to juveniles, I just want to make you all aware of the juvenile reentry and transition to adulthood subcommittee that is part of the Federal Interagency Reentry Council. Uh, the subcommittee is led by me and my fellow colleague in the Department of Labor, uh, Richard Mars and we're comprised of other federal um, officials, practitioners, and child advocates. Um, his mission is to further recommendations that have come out of the uh, Juvenile Reentry Issues Working Group of OJJDP's Coordinating Council on Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention, and also to be a voice for the youthful offender as well as the juvenile justice system as a whole in the larger prisoner reentry field. Now, to date, uh, the subcommittee has produced three juvenile reentry mythbusters, uh, one of which uh, Linda Melgreen um, talked about regarding Medicaid suspension and termination um, for juveniles, which is essentially the same, um, the same information. Um, but we've got the last two remaining mythbusters. One is on the youth access to education uh, upon reentry. And the fact is, is that many of the youth who are incarcerated and are returning to the community have strong aspirations to continue um, in a school setting. Uh, we know that many of these youth face barriers into re-entering into the school system, and ideally what we're looking for is a comprehensive re-entry plan which addresses the educational needs um, of these youth as part of the reintegration um, um, plan, discharge plan, um, back into the community. And again, we know that that must begin early upon um, confinement and incarceration. And looking at a think, exit, and entry philosophy of a student-driven, um, looking at the strengths and weaknesses um, of these youth um, is part of a successful education reentry plan. Uh, the second one we talked about uh, that we wrote on is on juvenile records and accessing uh, juvenile criminal records is strictly limited. This is one of the, I guess, the only myth buster that actually the, the fact may be um, not quite what folks want to hear, but in reality the fact is that the privacy of the juvenile court records have been ero eroded over time. Um, all states have different policies and procedures um, in place for allowing criminal justice um, 
and it needs access to juvenile information. But what um, the juvenile justice field needs to be concerned with and needs to focus on is the uh, criminal justice repositories of retention and dissemination policies, especially dissemination policies. Um, we're talking about a potential um, employees. And, um, and Todd talked a lot about, about the barriers that um, adults uh, face in gaining employment. Um, in the new year, we're, going to, we're looking, the subcommittee is also going to be looking at producing more juvenile-related um, related myth busters. Right now, we're going to be working on the Family Education Rights and Privacy Act, which is FERPA, um, with the Department of Education colleagues, and we're hoping to get um, to be working on that in the new year. Now, with that, I'll turn it back over to Amy for some concluding remarks. Great. Thank you, Tom. Um, and thank you to everyone for walking through these Mythbusters. Uh, so clearly, I hope, uh, for the group who's listening, we do want to, before turning to your questions, uh, point you to some direct links to all of our materials, which you should be able to see on your screen. These will take you directly to the Reentry Council website, uh, all of the Mythbusters, the letter that was referenced uh, from Secretary Donvin, another letter from, Secretary, uh, from Attorney General Holder on collateral consequences, uh, some other public education materials, as well as the uh, National Reentry Resource Center website. So I hope uh, these resources will be helpful to you. We now have a good deal of time, which we're going to dedicate to the questions that are coming in. Marlene Beckman from Justice is going to moderate the question and answer session and we will try to get through as many as we can. And you can keep them coming throughout this session. And um, Marlene, I'm going to turn it to you. Okay. Well, we have uh, quite a few questions already. Uh, quite a few questions already. And I'm going to start with uh, Ron from HUD. Ron, a question has come in with regard to uh, how do we convince our local public housing authority to change their policies and become more felon-friendly regarding the returning population? Okay, that, that, that's a great question. And in the, um, when I talked earlier, I said that there were three primary impediments. One is the fact that the neighbors may not want the ex-offender ex in. The other is the housing authority's fear of a headline. And then the third is the fact that the housing authority may not convince that there's a safety net out there. You can be that safety net. If you were to get together with your other uh, community-based organizations and put together a plan so that an ex-offender coming back is going to have case management, he's going to have substance abuse counseling, he's going to have employment training and access to employment, then you could go to the housing authority and say, we have a plan. Basically, we have your back. Can we have a discussion about can we create a program? Uh, probably the housing authority won't do a blanket. We're going to change our regs. But they could very well say that everyone in this program, let's call it an ABC program, will be allowed to come into public housing. So that would be a way to go. And that's why you are so valuable to the reentry effort. Okay, next we have a question uh, for Todd from the EEOC. If a person believes that they have been discriminated against because they have a criminal record, what should they do? Thank you, Marlene. Um, I think the first, first, first thing the person should do is visit our website, uh, eeoc.gov. Uh, there you will find a list of our local offices, and you should contact that uh, the office closest to you to file a charge. You can also, at the same time on our website, uh, there's an online assessment if you're ready to file a charge to sort of help you work through the process. But the first thing I would do is visit our website, eeoc.gov. Um, you can file a charge there. You can also find an office to, um, to contact to file a charge. Okay. Um, Linda, uh, you talked a lot about various benefits. Um, callers are asking, how do they get information about eligibility uh, in their state? I think that there's a couple of ways um, to approach that that issue. The first is, is on all of these Mythbusters, um, there is in fact a, a other additional resource um, section which would send you to some websites that have more information about that particular program. 
The other way is to go to the agencies themselves in your state, whether it be the Medicaid agency or the Child Welfare Agency or the Child Support Agency or any um, of the federal agencies involved and initiate a conversation with them. You, know, you can go to their websites and get some general information. Uh, but for the most part, if what you want to do is find out sort of in general, you know, what kinds of, of issues, what kinds of additional activities can be taken, um, you will need to engage in conversations with your particular state and that program that you're interested in. Thank you, Linda. Uh, our colleague Al Fatour is on the telephone, and we have a uh, question about Social Security. Al, uh, someone is asking, what are the differences between getting Social Security benefits started and uh, social, social Security disability benefits started for someone coming out of prison, SSI? Uh, what is the difference between Social Security and SSI benefits for a person released from prison? Uh, thanks for that question. Uh, as you may know, probably know, we administer two programs, Social Security benefits and Supplemental Security Income benefits, which we call SSI. Uh, Social Security is a program that's based on wages that people earn in pain of the system. We have benefits there for people who are retired, disabled, and survivors' benefits. Uh, under SSI, we pay benefits. Uh, it's a means-tested program, and we pay benefits to people who are 65 and older or disabled. It's not based on work and earnings. It's based on being 65 or disabled and being uh, having low income. Uh, by law, Social Security benefits cannot be paid to someone who's incarcerated, uh, and benefits are suspended. But we don't terminate the benefits if you're on Social Security and go into a prison, your benefits are suspended and stay in a suspense status. And you can be in for quite a few years. When you come out, you're still in suspense status, and generally we can reinstate benefits fairly quickly. A new claim would not be needed. SSI is a little different. If you go into prison and you're receiving SSI, uh, we will keep you suspended for up to 12 months. After 12 months, the SSI eligibility is terminated, and if you come out after 12 months, to get back on SSI, you would have to file a new claim for benefits. Uh, for both Social Security and SSI, we offer a pre-release procedure, uh, and many of our field offices have arrangements with a lot of prisons, some with many states. Um, we take claims a couple months early, usually up to three months early, to try to get the claim started when it's needed. So when a person comes out, the claim will be completed or nearly completed, and we can start benefits uh, quickly. Okay, Back to you now. Thank you. Uh, we have a question on Pell Grants. This is for John from the Department of Education. I understand that some prisoners are eligible for Pell Grants and others are not. Is this because of the restriction on grants for persons with drug convictions? Are drug offenders still ineligible even after leaving prison? Thanks, Marlene. Hi. Um, there's a couple of things that make it a little more complicated in terms of eligibility for Pell Grants for offenders. And uh, Congress has removed eligibility for individuals who are incarcerated at both federal and state institutions. I noticed that there was a question uh, typed in the chat uh, with regard to halfway houses, and the department has indicated that uh, individuals in halfway houses, even though they're still technically inmates, would be eligible for Pell Grants. Uh, uh, and of course, anybody in, in local confinement and not in a state or federal institution uh, is eligible for Pell Grants. But the other factor that complicates it a little bit is that eligibility had been restricted for individuals with drug convictions. Uh, after Congress um, made that restriction, they came back and relaxed it somewhat. So it's not a really onerous restriction anymore, but unfortunately, I think a lot of people are still under the misimpression that uh, the drug conviction is more of an obstacle than it is. So um, individuals that were receiving federal student financial aid and con were convicted of an offense of possession or selling drugs 
during the time that they were receiving student financial aid do face some obstacles to their eligibility. But um, a, a drug conviction wouldn't matter for eligibility for a person, for example, that's not previously received financial aid. So I, I hope that would clarify it a little bit. Thank you. Uh, Sean, I'm going to turn to you and some questions about uh, veterans. Uh, a question that has been asked about uh, when an incarcerated veteran's benefits are reduced, can the veteran's family receive the balance? Thanks, Marlene, and that's an excellent question. So what happens to this money that a veteran had been receiving prior to incarceration uh, once the benefit uh, is reduced for the term of that incarceration? The, the process to know about here is what's known as apportionment, and this is something that the, the veteran him or herself uh, requests, uh, and, and the procedure for how to request it uh, is contained in the communication that goes from VBA to the veteran, uh, informing him or her that the benefits are going to be reduced as a result of the incarceration. Uh, again, it, it's known as apportionment, and it can, it's a process where the balance, uh, so say an individual was receiving, uh, was rated as 100% uh, disabled uh, with a service-connected disability um, and receiving benefits at the maximum amount. Those would be reduced to 10% uh, of their former level. That remaining 90% can be assigned um, to the veteran's family members, so to a spouse, to dependent children, to parents in some circumstances, uh, and again, um, that is uh, available uh, when the benefit is reduced as a result of incarceration, uh, and, and a good thing to know about. Uh, sticking with you for a moment, Sean, uh, there's been some questions about whether there's a VA website that details the veteran's benefits so that the caller can understand more about the differences between felony and misdemeanor uh, benefits and availability. The website is, is an excellent resource, and I would point you to the, to the Veterans Benefits uh, Mythbuster um, that we've got here. And the, uh, the VA, www.va.gov website, the overall VA uh, website, is a place to start. VBA.gov um, will get you closer. Um, that has more information specifically uh, about the monetary benefits available. Uh, also, uh, and again, these are all written on the Mythbuster, but I'll just say them. Um, ebenefits.va.gov. That also contains information about how to apply for these benefits online. Um, yes, I think that covers Yes. Um, Ron, uh, turning to you and Hug. Um, uh, folks that are asking when the local public housing authority does not ban offenders uh, but have extensive waiting lists, offenders are often at the bottom. Any suggestions to address this? The only um, waiting lists are, are fact. They're a fact of life at housing authorities across the country. The only way in would be to go get on the lease with someone who exists there already. So, for example, in our pilot program, we're, we're trying to see most of the guys, most of the ex-offenders are men. Uh, so is there a mother, cousin, aunt, girlfriend who would be willing to have the guy, the ex-offender, on, on the lease? And, of course, this is something that the housing authority would have to approve. But that's a way to get around the waiting list. Okay, thank you. Um, Todd, I wanted to ask you a question to come in. Uh, do the EEOC employment policies apply to those on parole and supervised release, as well as those who are incarcerated? Thanks, Marlene. Yes. Um, our guidance, which uh, restates or, 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 or discusses Title VII's application in this area, apply to those with arrest and eviction records. Uh, and that would include those who um, are currently um, uh, on parole, on supervised release, or on probation, as well as those uh, who are formerly incarcerated. Okay. Uh, Richard, there's a few questions uh, regarding the Department of Labor and bonding, and two specific to uh, two states. With regard to Arizona, someone from Arizona has said that their state only has seven bonds available for the entire state. Is this federal or state policy? At the federal level, we typically will provide what we refer to as floor bonds that are uh, essentially uh, used to, uh, uh, to hopefully serve as incentives 
for state uh, uh, agencies, uh, community-based organizations, and placement agencies to consider the purchase of additional bonds. Uh, in fact, uh, one can go to uh, their uh, federal bonding uh, coordinator, state federal bonding coordinator, and seek out packages of bonds in either 25, 50, 75, or 100. The only uh, stipulation there is that bonds subsequently purchased must then be used within 24 months. Uh, but there is no uh, prohibition against uh, uh, reaching out to, to, as they say, uh, state agencies, community-based organizations, which are often uh, purchases of such bonds, uh, or placement agencies uh, to uh, obtain additional bonds. Okay. Uh, thank you for that. A caller from uh, Kentucky uh, asked, does, says that their state does not have federal bonding and ask whether employers can purchase this on their own. Indeed, uh, the, the recommendation would be in the case of such states where there is not, uh, where the state itself is not participating in the federal bonding program and or does not have a state federal bonding coordinator, the One Stop Career Centers and other placement agencies can be uh, approached uh, and bonds can then be uh, directly purchased from them or uh, through the federal bonding program itself. Uh, in the form of the uh, McLaughlin Company, who serves as the uh, exclusive uh, and national agent of the St. Paul's Travelers Insurance Company, who in fact uh, provides the fidelity bonds. And uh, just sticking with you for a moment, one more question. Is there a resource list of WOTC employers for each state? I would encourage, while there, there may not be a, a uh, a list that has been formally developed, I would encourage anyone who is so uh, inclined to, to want to explore that further to reach out to their uh, uh, work opportunity tax credit uh, state coordinator, and we have one in each state, and they would be the best resource for identifying those employers who uh, would be so inclined to participate in, in such a program. Okay, thank you. Uh, Linda, question on parental rights. A uh, caller is asking, how do I get my client's child support order reduced during the time he is incarcerated? Um, you have to contact the child support agency um, and ask for a modification of the order. If you're in, you know, one of the states that has, uh, half of the states that have procedures in place, you know, they will, there will be a, a, a pretty good chance for you to get the order modified. Um, in the other states, um, what has to happen is that the order has to, will have to go through a process, usually through a judge, and there will have to be a consideration of the facts of the case. In a few states, being incarcerated is not considered um, a, a, a reason for modifying an order. Um, so what you might want to do is have a conversation with your child support agency, find out um, what the rules are in your state, and then um, if it's appropriate, request a modification. Uh, but it has to go through the child support agency. Uh, related question, Linda, is, is there a website with all the information on child support? Um, the, the place to start is the website um, of the Office of Child Support Enforcement. That's part of the Department of Health and Human Services. So if you go to the, the to www.hhs.gov and Google in child support, that should in fact give you the child support website. There's all kinds of information um, on that website about the various rules, including an interactive map which will take you to each of the state's child support websites. Um, and those websites um, will have much of the kind of information you, you need um, and will also have contact information for you to follow up and get additional information. And one more while we're on with you, Linda, a question came up about whether there was uh, points of contact for those who oversee federal benefits? Um, 
In fact, we are, the Benefit Access Subcommittee is working on developing uh, such a point of contact list so that all of the different federal agencies can talk to each other um, and so that it will be possible to find out, you know, sort of what is going on um, in each of the federal pro benefit programs. Um, the list is in process now, so stay tuned for additional information. Okay, great. Thanks. We'll all do that. Uh, turning to Sean and VA, a question has come in about what can the VA do for veterans who are currently incarcerated? Thank you. I, I mentioned a lot about what cannot happen uh, when a veteran is incarcerated, and there, there are a couple of important things to mention that the VA does do uh, while, while veterans are, are in prison or in jail. Um, the primary uh, activity to talk, to talk about there is the direct outreach and reentry planning assistance um, that VA provides to, to veterans uh, who are incarcerated. There are two programs for this. Um, the first is focused on the state and federal prison system and is known as health care for reentry veterans. Uh, of the 1,300 or so uh, state and federal prisons in the United States, uh, VA HCRV specialists are in more than 1,000 of them uh, working with veterans as they prepare uh, to reenter their communities. The newer program of the two is Veterans Justice Outreach, and this, among other things, works with veterans uh, who are incarcerated in local jails. Uh, the work looks much the same. The focus is um, an initial clinical assessment, again, not treatment because we're not able to do that, um, but initial planning services and a linkage with those services once the veteran is back out in the community. Um, so working with the bar against treatment, VA provides assistance in the form of outreach and planning assistance and linking veterans to services once they're out. Thank you, Sean. Uh, we have a question on uh, juveniles. Uh, what can be done to ensure that returning young offenders are quickly enrolled into their home school system? Uh, Tom, can you address that, please? Um, yes, I, I believe I touched on that a little in, the, um, in my presentation, but quick and um, quick reentry into the school system should be part of the youth uh, discharge reentry plan when the youth is incarcerated. So the key is is to link up um, with the school system while we, um, immediately upon when the when the youth uh, is is confined um, in detention or in long term confinement. Same would go with um, any other type of that secure, non-secure residential facility. So again, it needs to be part of the overall reentry plan, um, and it has to begin early. And uh, you need to break, be able to um, link, reach out to the school system in which the um, the youth is returning. And as we all know, is that um, that school system may be either within the community of the residential facility, or it could be halfway across the state. So there's a challenge there, but the, the key is is that, you know, education is a key component of a juvenile's reentry and discharge plan. Okay, thank you. Uh, Ron, uh, a caller is asking about the status of the pilot program you mentioned. Okay, the status of the pilot program is we have not launched that, that, that program. It was in the budget. Unfortunately, it was taken out of the budget. So right now what we're trying to do is we are going to foundations, actually, uh, talking to foundations and seeing if the foundation will fund particular housing authorities that we know want to walk down this road. I mentioned um, Health and Human Services. They had a marriage and fatherhood program where ex-offenders would live in housing. Uh, we did have about four housing authorities that applied for those, for those grants and basically we're willing to have ex-offenders live in public housing and well, along with some of the wraparound services. So we're trying to work with those housing authorities to see if we can get some funding for them so that they can be the pilot program. Okay, great. Uh, for the Labor Department, can an employer use WOTC for felons hired after release from local jail and not prison. Yes, the, 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 uh, the principal restriction is that uh, the WOTC uh, uh, incentive needs to uh, occur within one year of conviction or release uh, from the facility. So there is that one year limitation. Uh, and then within that context, uh, 
uh, the actual application for the work opportunity tax credit has to happen within the first 28 days of uh, the hire date. All right, thank you. Uh, Linda, what if somebody uh, is in jail for only a short time? Do they lose their Medicaid benefits? Um, the restrictions on Medicaid indicate that um, you cannot pay for Medicaid benefits when somebody is in a public institution. Remember when I said that there's a difference between suspension and termination. But while someone was in an institution, whether they're eligible for Medicaid, suspended from Medicaid, those services provided in that institution cannot be paid for by Medicaid. That's not the same as losing eligibility. It just means that the um, care provided by the institution cannot be billed to Medicaid during that period of time. Linda, I have a somewhat more specific question for you um, from a caller. Is asking if a patient is in treatment at home and subsequently is incarcerated, can the FQHC provider continue and bill made Medicaid rendered in the correctional facility? Um, I'm, I'm not. Um, 100% sure, but given the uh, response I just gave in the previous uh, question, and that is that if the care is rendered in a public institution, in a jail or a prison, it cannot be uh, reimbursed uh, by Medicaid, I would say no. That they can continue to provide care, they could provide care under a contract with the Department of Correction but that there is unlikely to be Medicaid reimbursement. Thank you for that. Um, uh, Al, uh, this is a question about Social Security. You, you talked about the fact that you, that Medicaid, uh, I mean, the Social Security could be reinstated before a person leaves prison or they, they could apply for their um, Social Security before they leave prison. Uh, and you have certain MOUs, uh, how can someone find out whether or not they have, that, that is true for their particular state or jurisdiction? There's several ways you can go about that. I think right now the best way would be if you're working with a particular prisoner, you would contact the, the, the field office that services that prison and they would be the office that handles the uh, pre-release procedure. They would uh, able to advise you on whether there's an agreement there or not. Uh, I think that, that's, that's pretty much the best way to do that, the quickest way. Okay, thank you. And I will mention also, with, when the point of contact uh, project is up and running that Linda mentioned just a little while ago, there will be regional contacts uh, for all 10 Social Security regional offices. So questions of that nature can be funneled to that point of contact. All right, thank you for that. Uh, Ron, we actually had a few, few questions about sex offenders and their ban from public housing. Uh, this caller is asking, uh, are all sex offenders banned from public housing for life? If not, what is the lifetime ban? Okay, and I'm going to read actually from the Mythbuster, and this is from our Code of Federal Registration of uh, Federal Regulations. If any member of the household is subject to a lifetime registration requirement under a state sex offender registration program, that person is barred from public health. Okay. I think every state uh, has one of those. Uh, uh, you can get it. Every state has that. Uh, you can learn that from your state registry. All right. Um, Back to Linda and HHS, uh, is it true that a license can be revoked solely for back child support? And if so, this creates, of course, an extreme uh, hardship in gaining employment. Can you comment on that? Yes, it is true. There is a federal requirement that all states have to have procedures in which they can revoke a driver's license because somebody is not in compliance with their child support order. 
This usually doesn't happen unless there is a very large amount of child support that has been unpaid. And the way that it can be rectified is for the individual to contact their child support agency, to say that they are willing to um, enter into a repayment plan um, to figure out a way that they can um, pay off their back due child support. And generally, if such a repayment plan is put in place, um, the license will be reinstated. It does not depend on paying off all of the overdue child support, but having made a commitment and, and developed a plan to actually work on paying off that child support. Thank you, Linda. Uh, Todd, we have a question uh, regarding the EEOC. Is it discriminatory due to, uh, is it discrimination due to disability if a job offer is retracted due to a criminal history? If no, what discrimination category is appropriate? Well, let me answer that question this way. I mean, the case law and our guidance addresses the issue primarily through Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which uh, bans discrimination uh, in employment based on race, color, national origin, religion, or sex. And that's because of the potential disparate impact um, that uh, such discrimination might have on workers because of the race or national origin. And also it's designed to protect uh, against disparate treatment, as we call it, which is treating people uh, with the same criminal records differently because of race or national origin. However, with regard to reentry and disability, there is a potential overlap with the uh, ADA, the Americans with Disability Act, uh, in this way, particularly as it applies to those claiming a drug addiction and whether that condition should or should not be covered by the ADA. So there are actual overlaps, uh, but the primary analysis has been under Title VII with regard to the arrest and conviction issue that we've been discussing. And I would encourage folks also to look at the Mythbuster that we've produced, and there are some links on there to our website um, that, that gives information about our guidance and, and the discussion of the issue. But also our website also has extensive discussion and um, uh, materials on the ADA and its application across the board. Thank you, Todd. Um, Sean, with, can you talk a little bit about uh, incarcerated veterans' eligibility for compensation and pension assessment and how that information is disseminated? Incarcerated veterans are eligible uh, to receive examinations uh, for compensation and pension benefits. These are, are known often by the shorthand comp and pen. Uh, so if you hear that, that's, what, that's a reference to. Uh, logistically, these can take some time to arrange uh, for veterans who may be incarcerated um, in a facility that's, that's geographically far uh, from, from any VA facility, uh, but they are absolutely eligible uh, for comp and pen assessment, uh, and, and VA does provide them. Um, how that information is disseminated, um, I mentioned earlier the outreach uh, that VA does in jail and prison facilities. That information about that process uh, is always a part of it. Veterans who are incarcerated can apply for disability benefits, and that, the competent exam is the first step in that process, one of the first steps. They can also enroll, uh, if they've been deemed eligible, they can enroll in the VA healthcare system. Again, they can't start receiving the care, but they can get enrolled. And so both of these things, as, as well as, as several other benefits and steps to take after their release, uh, are the topics of conversation when our outreach specialists see them in prisons and jail. Thank you for that. Um, Richard, a question about employer incentives. Uh, can you mention a little more about employer incentive to hire an ex-offender? Sure. Uh, thank you for the question. <laughs> there, indeed, uh, probably the, the easiest reference is, in fact, as we look at the uh, work out to the tax uh, credit, is the NIFBUSTER itself, which makes the point of suggesting that uh, participating employers, in fact, are going to be compensated uh, through their participation by being able to reduce their federal income tax liability. It's probably also worth noting that there is, in fact, no limit to the number of, if you will, new ex uh, felons that an employer uh, can, in fact, hire and indeed uh, enjoy those tax benefits and savings. So from the point of view of the work opportunity tax credit, not only do we have that benefit, but we also have now uh, the additional uh, benefit of 
nine targeted groups that my colleague uh, uh, Todd uh, pointed out uh, in his earlier presentation that also now uh, become eligible for consideration when you look at what are the tax advantages for uh, the hiring of such individuals. And that includes, of course, ex-offenders. And as I pointed out earlier, uh, that includes individuals who were convicted of a felony uh, and, in fact, who were hired within one year of their conviction or released from prison. If we look at the other uh, major incentive uh, that is offered, uh, that being the federal bonding program, uh, we see that the participation, again, and, and the impact uh, of involvement in the federal bonding program is the expansion of the eligible pool of potential employees that the employer now can look at. It's probably worth noting that while 90% of the uh, uh, federal bonds that are issued are in conjunction with uh, returning offenders, in point of fact, you don't have to be an offender in order to uh, be eligible for a federal bond. Uh, in fact, uh, we also, uh, you will also see those being issued for recovery of uh, substance abusers, uh, persons who are typically uh, in uh, current rehabilitation, even individuals with a poor credit record or who have declared uh, bankruptcy, those who uh, unfortunately uh, uh, were dishonorably discharged from the military also could be uh, uh, a candidate for a federal bonding program. Persons who, in fact, are lacking in work history is another example of someone who would be eligible for consideration of the federal bonding program. And I think finally, and, and, and worthy of note, uh, is that we have, bear with me, we have also have individuals uh, where bonds can be issued by a foreign individual who is already employed, uh, in point of fact, provided that that bonding is needed in order to either prevent uh, being laid off or to secure a transfer or promotion to a new job with the company. So in point of fact, a bonding coverage can be applied to any job at any employer in any state. Great. Well, thank you for that. That's very helpful. Uh, John, we have a question on education. Can a state college deny attendance based on a felony? Well, it's an interesting question, and there uh, seems to be an increased controversy about the use of um, criminal history records for college admissions, and there's a very interesting uh, recent publication on that topic that people might be interested in seeing. Uh, it's called The Use of Criminal History Records in College, college Admissions Reconsidered, and it was prepared by the Center for Community Alternatives, and it's readily available on their website. But there is no federal restriction on the use of um, criminal history records, felony convictions, other types of convictions uh, for admissions policies. Um, there may be restrictions in state law from state to state, but in general I don't think there are. And uh, there's been some very interesting conversations recently about uh, some of the policies in this area uh, in New York State for the state university system. So it's, uh, it's an area where there seems to be increased use of um, kind of the, the question about previous uh, criminal history on college admission applications and a uh, fair amount of controversy and inconsistency in terms of whether that information is requested and if it is, how it's used and what the policies are. But it is an area where uh, there should be dialogue taking place in states. People might want to participate in that uh, to assure that the policies that are put in place are really reasonable policies and not absolute bans that apply uh, in a very broad sense and are very discriminatory. All right, thank you for that. We have time for one last question, and that question is going to go to Ron and Hud. The question is, can those uh, people with drug charges live in public housing with their family members? What about uh, their receiving vouchers? Okay, so um, I want to, I would say that 99% of housing authorities have policies against drug, ex-drug offenders coming back into public housing, and 99% is probably an understatement. Um, so, so, and that's both on the conventional public housing side and on the voucher side. However, there are some housing authorities that are using the vouchers, Oakland Housing Authority in California, King County in Washington, Burlington uh, in New Hampshire, in Vermont, are, uh, you know, Easing, easing the ban on ex-offenders. So that's one avenue. The other avenue is that there is a DASH program, which is Veterans and Supportive Housing, where they are um, easing the ban also. They're overlooking uh, past criminal activity. Um, besides those two 
two, you know, examples. Really, if you have, if you're an ex-offender with a drug offense, um, housing authority is not going to let you in unless you work with the public housing authority or we can create some pilots where we can show that ex-offenders and those with drug convictions can live in public housing safely and um, legitimately. So we have to create those programs. And again, I would urge you, if you could, to put together a program and to go to the housing authority and talk to them and see which, where you can go with that. Well, thank you, Ron. I was hoping we could end on a more positive note. <laughs> uh, but I do want to say that the Reentry Council uh, is continuing to do our work, and uh, your questions will be very helpful to us as uh, we go forward in looking at the kinds of things that you are interested in and that hopefully we can uh, do some more to clarify and even change. Uh, thank you for participating today, and I'm going to turn it over to Sean. Great. Sean. Thank you. This is, yeah, Amy, did you want to say something? Nope. I was going to make sure. Sean Rogers, it's all yours. Yep. All right. Uh, thank you so much, uh, everybody. This is just a, a fantastic webinar. Uh, fantastic content. Um, just, just thank, thanks for, for doing this for us today. All right, then. This concludes today's webinar. After you exit the webinar, a brief survey will appear on the screen. By answering the questions in the survey, you will be helping the Resource Center improve on the services we offer. We'd greatly appreciate it if you would take just a few minutes to complete the survey. We will email a link to the recording of this presentation, as well as a link to a PDF of the PowerPoint slides used in the presentation, either late this week or early next week. These links will also be made available on the National Reentry Resource Center's website, which is www.nationalreentryresourcecenter.org. Thanks again for participating.